and Serge Phillips, who's helping uh, direct our IIJA efforts. Welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself and proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. My name is Nancy Doppenberger, and I'm the Commissioner of the Department of Transportation. And I am joined here today by my colleagues, Josh Kanadrud Hubinger, who is MnDOT's uh, CFO, our Chief Financial Officer, and uh, Serge Phillips, who is Manager of Federal Affairs. And so we appreciate this opportunity to provide you an update on the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, as well as additional funding forecast information. So with that, I would like to, if okay with you, turn it over to my colleague, Serge Phillips, to give you the IIJA update. Thank you, Commissioner. Welcome, Mr. Phillips. Thank you, Commissioner. No, no, um, Chair, Mr. Chair and members of the committee, my name is Serge Phillips. I'm here to be testify on behalf of the State Department of Transportation. Mr. Phillips, if you could um, either turn on your microphone or raise your voice a little. On the um, IIJA Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. Uh, the presentation will um, start with an introduction to federal surface transportation reauthorization, talk a little bit about highway dedicated funding, uh, competitive grant funding, highway and mass transit increased funding, uh, then state funding match, and the governor's 2022 capital budget recommendations and trunk highway bonding. So a little bit of background um, on federal funding and surface transportation reauthorization. U.S. Congress provides federal funding through five-year reauthorization acts that provide program authorization and funding levels, and then annual appropriations provide the year-to-year -year funding. And uh, historically, and in recent history as well, they have followed the levels uh, in the Surface Transportation Authorization Act. The vast majority of federal funding for transportation is for capital construction it's state administered and it's provided through reimbursement once the work is completed. <clears throat> Most programs provide um, an 80% federal funding portion with a 20% local match required. The Surface Transportation Act preceding IIJA was the FAST Act, Fixing America's Tra Surface Transportation Act, and that lasted from December 2015 to November 2021. And the new programs in that one were rail and freight. Those were added to um, surface transportation. So the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act is also known as the Bipartisan Infrastructure Bill, bill uh, and includes a five-year surface transportation reauthorization and became law in November 21. So that le left us with a tough year last year because the federal fiscal year starts October 1st. And they did a continuing resolution before this, uh, this um, bill was passed. And in fact, they didn't do a full year's um, appropriations until uh, 2022. So that affected, um, we didn't receive all of the, of the funding, particularly from the new programs, um, because they were not appropriated yet. The new law expands the definition of surface transportation to include funding for broadband, ports, water infrastructure, energy and power infrastructure, electric vehicles and airports. Now airports has their own reauthorization bill, um, or aviation does, but in this bill they had some funding just for airports for the, for the first time. It also provides first-time formula funding for carbon reduction and climate resiliency, so expands the definition of transportation to include uh, these new programs. And that was transformative. It also was transformative in the unprecedented amount uh, in competitive grant funding available, which is over 100 billion. So here's um, some specific slides on formula highway funding for projects over the next five years. Minnesota's uh, estimating that we're getting 4.8 billion over that time frame. And of that money, 3.6 billion is for existing projects, as shown is the, in the STIP, the, the Transportation Investment Program Act uh, plan. Um, and that's fast, fast act level funding. Then there's 630 million additional for existing 
formula highway programs, and $570 million for new programs. The $3.6 billion to fund existing fiscal year 22 through 26 program, um, the, for starters, the distribution is 70% MnDOT projects and 30% local federal aid projects. And um, the biggest uh, highway formula programs start with the National Highway System, um, and that covers the NHS, National Highway System. Second largest is the Congestion Mitigation Air Qual or STBG, which is the Surface Transportation Block Grant System, which um, has a, more of a majority of its funding for local projects. Then there's Congestion Mitigation and Air Quality, and then Highway Safety, the HSIP, and then the Freight Program, National Highway Freight Program. And um, all these programs, uh, contain criteria for their funding to apply to projects. So the, the projects are funded um, by their definition to those criteria within those programs. So then there's a 630 million additional for those existing programs, and that continues the 70% MnDOT, 30% local federal aid portion. And you have these slides, right? Yeah. And then finally, the new programs um, average 115 million a year, uh, and that's divided up by 65 million for bridge investments, uh, 13 million a year for the EV charging stations, electric vehicle charging stations, and 37 million a year for carbon reduction and resiliency. Now, the bulk of these new programs will be delivered after 2023. Um, so uh, another hallmark of surface transportation reauthorization is that the money, um, if it doesn't flow during one year or second year like these new programs, you still get the same amount of money expected over five years. It just comes in greater proportions in those last three years. And you can move money around within the years uh, forward and backward. So it, that's crucial flexibility for our uh, programming. So I'll turn next to pre-existing IIJ competitive grants. Um, as I noted earlier, the competitive grants level of funding was unprecedented. And it starts uh, with grant programs that were already in existence. The INFRA grant, which stands for Infrastructure for Rebuilding America. That went from about $1 billion a year to $14 billion over the five years. And that's for projects that um, uh, have as a purpose highway or bridge mobility, intermodal or freight projects, and rail grade crossing separations. And then in 2022, Minnesota received uh, 35 million um, in awards for those. Austin Bridges got 25 million, and US 212 and Carver County got 10. Uh, the RAISE grant program also got a boost. Now it gets 7.5 billion over the five years and that stands for Rebuilding American Infrastructure with Sustainability and Equity, and that's for surface transportation projects of local or regional significance, and Minnesota received 99 million there. Uh, six projects um, got awards. The largest were Duluth, Superior Street got 25 million, Rochester, Sixth Street Bridge got 19.9, and Bemidji Highway 197 got 18 million. So, so the new um, IIJ competitive grant programs now, first is a big in bridge investment program, which is in addition to the bridge formula funding. Uh, that, got, that has $12.5 in money to award over the five years, and that's for projects to replace, rehabilitate, and preserve bridges in the National Bridge Inventory. Um, we applied in the fall for that one for Blatnik Bridge. We didn't, we weren't successful. The biggest winner uh, nationally was the Brent Spence Bridge on the border of Kentucky and um, Ohio, uh, right next to, right on the edge of Cincinnati. Um, next is the National Infrastructure Project Assistance Program, mega projects, uh, get five billion. Uh, that's mega projects that will generate national, regional, economic, mobility, or safety benefits. And those awards were tied with the bridge awards in some cases. So they, they sort of tied um, the, them together so that 
particular Brent Spence Bridge got even more money. Safe streets and roads for all, five billion over five years, and that uh, is just for city and county projects. State, state DOTs could not apply for this uh, grant program. Uh, city and county projects that support local initiatives to prevent death and serious injury on roads. Then there's the new PROTECT program, which we're still waiting for details. Uh, we expect them to be coming in the spring here, or winter and late winter and spring. And that's promoting resilient operations for transformative, if efficient, and cost-saving transportation grants. And that's for planning resilience improvements, community resilience, and evacuation routes. There's the rural program for a billion dollars, and that's to improve infrastructure in rural areas to increase connectivity, safety, and reliability. And Minnesota received one of just six grants there, uh, a $26 million grant for the Moorhead grade crossing. And now I've got a chart for you, IIJ competitive grant opportunities. You see on the left, uh, far left, it's uh, on the top portion, it's programs that have been released, and we're, we're even um, re starting up a new round for raise. They just released the notice of funding. And then below, the released ones are upcoming uh, grant programs, which are in their first round of. And um, Minnesota, uh, uh, MnDOT is working with a consultant and with the governor's office um, on uh, finding good projects for these and uh, working with uh, other partners like cities and counties and tribes. Uh, next are um, some slides on the new IIJA programs, uh, starting with the bridge program. Uh, and that is in addition to the uh, formula highway program. It's a, it's a formula bridge program um, but eligible uses are just for bridge replacement, rehabilitation, preservation, protection, or construction. And 15% per state are for bridges off the federal aid system. And this is one of the few programs where it's, um, or that 15% portion uh, is funded at 100% federal, no local match required. And that comes out to about 300 million over the five years from MnDOT. Then there's the new uh, highway formula programs in carbon reduction and resiliency. Carbon reduction gets 107 million over five years, and it's for new formula carbon reduction program to reduce transportation greenhouse emissions. Um, and states have to develop a carbon reduction strategy within two years. So we're we're in halfway through that. We're going to have that done by the end of uh, 23, and that strategy will contain uh, projects. The PROTECT program is 121 million over five years, and there's also a national competitive grant program in addition to the formula funds. Uh, the National Electric Vehicle Infrastructure Program uh, means about 68 million for Minnesota over the five years, still a 20% non-federal match. Uh, requests for qualifications and proposals are coming up in the spring of 2023. Phase one chargers should be installed by 2024, and they're going to be along uh, 35W and I-94 um, in, in um, this IIJA period of time. Um, and they'll also be charging and fueling infrastructure competitive grants. So mass transit funding now, turning to that for Greater Minnesota and MnDOT. Of course, just handles um, mass transit funding outside the the metropolitan areas over 50,000. If they're if they're over 50,000, the MPOs handle the transit projects. If they're under that, uh, Min MinDOT um, uh, invests in those programs. And there are three federal formula programs that support investment in operating and capital for Greater Minnesota Transit. That's urbanized area formula grants rural transit and inner city bus and bus and bus facilities. And IIJA provides a significant increase in each of those programs over the next five years with the, mo with the largest increase coming in the past year, 22. It was like a 30% increase over the 21 baseline. So I think, so, oh, just in closing, um, carbon reduction, Environmental sustainability and resilience and equity and safety are the key themes of IIJA. 
And um, it provides a mix of dedicated funding for existing highway and mass transit programs, as well as competitive funding for both existing and new ones, and provides many opportunities for new programs and unfunded projects to compete for or leverage to identify even more funding from other sources, including state sources. So um, in many cases, they're looking through grants and through the formula funding to find partial funding that then uh, states would complete. So I think now I turn over the, the bonding portion uh, to my our CFO, Josh Natarud Hubinger. Thanks, Serge. I'm glad to be here for the record. Josh Knatterd Hubinger, CFO for MnDOT. I just have a couple slides in closing. It's a good segue, I think, to the next topic um, up for discussion. So I will start with this slide, which I think does a nice job of summarizing with all these moving pieces of new money from IIJA what that means to Minnesota. So everything Mr. Phillips just went through, here is in one nice summary slide. This should look familiar to many of you from last session. It has been unchanged. So about 240 million of new money for roads and bridges split between MnDOT and our local partners. That's the first two lines. Of course, all of these new federal funds come with state and local match requirements. Um, we're in year two of the bill, uh, still working on that state and local match. Um, for FAA, uh, also part of IIJA, there's about 60 million more in new federal money. Um, for FTA, what uh, Mr. Phillips just covered on the greater Minnesota portion, uh, there's about 13 million of additional funding there. And then because of all these new discretionary programs or new or expanded discretionary programs, um, we're, we're just putting in an estimate to get a sense of magnitude for how much money could come to Minnesota. Every one of these grant, grants are competitive, so we of course have to apply and be successful. Um, but as we've referenced in previous slides, we've been pretty successful as a state to date already. Um, so that could be up to four to 500 million a year over the life of IIJA, and that would be a mix of all the modes. So roads and bridges, transit, passenger rail, et cetera. So add that up, that's almost $800 million of new federal funds to the state um, with a corresponding match need of about 185 million. Uh, like Senator Dibble mentioned at the beginning, um, the one quirk for that top line, the federal spending by MnDOT for roads and bridges, that does require one extra step to be able to spend that. That needs a direct appropriation from the legislature. So we are still waiting on that authority for both state fiscal year 22 and state fiscal year 23. It's a total of 315.5 million. We're still waiting to unlock in budget authority. Um, for everything else, at least on the federal side, we have the authority to spend it. Um, still working on that state and local match. So what I was just referencing for that budget authority, so this is that 315 million, excuse me, um, for both state fiscal years 22 and 23. Uh, we were able as an agency to deliver all of our federal fiscal year 22 funds uh, by using some existing bond authority and moving some projects out. Uh, and so if we do receive that 315 in budget authority, the effect of that would be to free up those bonds again for match for discretionary grants, would provide also some match for some of those new programs, uh, and would also help address some inflationary impacts and gaps on existing projects. Uh, we also are currently about 80 million short of our uh, projects in our STIP relative to our budget authority that we currently have. And then just to give a sense, I know we'll probably have more discussions about this throughout session, but where we sit in terms of needs. So just a quick snapshot of uh, bridge and pavement conditions. Um, obviously our two biggest areas in terms of assets. Uh, you can see this is um, red means we're not meeting our performance targets, green means we, we are. Yellow is kind of in that danger zone. Um, I'll just focus on the poor conditions. So we have performance targets for both good and poor condition. Um, on the bridge side, if you look at poor condition, our target is to be no more than 5% of the total system on the NHS. We're right now at just over 6% um, with some targeted investments due to IIJA, looking to get under that 5% threshold by the end of our current STIP. But then as we get to the end of our 10-year plan, our CHIP uh, projected to exceed our performance target and actually get a little bit worse. Uh, I will mention that a big part driving that 11% is our very large bridge in uh, Duluth, the Blatnick Bridge. Um, if that project gets funded, that percentage can go quite a bit down. 
Um, because we prioritize our NHS system, you can see on our other state bridges, uh, we're in pretty good shape currently relative, relative to a higher percent poor target of 8%, but they're too projecting to get a little bit worse over the next 10 years. And then on pavement, uh, good news first, if you see that current column, uh, current state of our pavement, it's in really good shape. Lots of investments over the last couple years to uh, keep it in good condition. Uh, and you can see mostly green through the end of the stip. Again, we're prioritizing asset preservation, and so you can see that trend staying green. But then as you look out a little farther, those conditions do start to worsen a little bit. And that's, I think, all we had for a presentation. Happy to answer any questions. Um, thank you very much. Uh, members, questions? Um, I had um, <clears throat> just a couple of quick questions. Um, the first thing I wanted to ask about was uh, the, um, so I didn't hear much discussion about passenger rail. I was curious about some of those uh, programs. Um, I was looking at the IIJ competitive grant opportunities and um, I know that the corridor identification and development program um, is an upcoming opportunity um, to, to put in for some IIJA support. Um, if we could receive a kind of a brief description of what that is and are there any other opportunities to look for support for some of the passenger rail uh, potential either projects that we've already uh, discussed in Minnesota or potential projects. So I can take that one, Chair Dibble, members. Um, so high level, when we're showing that big number of potential discretionary money coming to the state of Minnesota, that 450 million on the screen, uh, about a third of all of the discretionary money in IIJA is passenger rail. And so there is a lot of money out there and available um, it's still in the early stages for NOFOs coming out for those specific types of solicitations. Uh, but absolutely, that is a really big possibility for us as a state. I think the obvious uh, potentials there would be things we've discussed in this committee before, uh, Northern Lights Express to Duluth as an easy example. Um, lots of opportunities, but a little early in terms of those uh, tangible NOFOs or things out there from USDOT at this point. Thanks. Um, and and uh, as I understand from uh, people who, uh, you know, approach me, um, the corridor identification and development program is base is a there's a no match requirement for that. It's the opportunity to, oh, thank you, um, take a look at um, uh, some corridors that have previously gone unstudied. Are we planning to take a look at some of those opportunities? Chair Dibble and members, um, yeah, the corridor identification program, the, the first uh, phase of that was just submitting all the different corridors within the state that um, might be pursued someday for additional funding for development. And so in, in order to poise ourselves to be ready to, um, to nominate or, or put in a candidate corridor, we did submit um, all those that we've been tracking throughout the state. So that first phase, we, we did that. And uh, so then now we're just gonna be waiting for additional program criteria to come out with the NOFO in order to put forth, uh, see what the criteria is first and then put forth a competitive um, funding proposal. Great. Thank you, uh, Commissioner. Could I, um, could you make me, make us aware of, not right now, maybe, maybe in writing, Future, in the near future, uh, what, what, which corridors those are. Chair, thank you, Chair, for that question. Certainly, we can come back at some point and, and talk through the different corridors, the status, and, right. and the well, program, if that Actually, a little uh, preview, members. We're going to have a passenger rail day here soon, so <laughs> maybe that will be the opportunity Certainly. for that. And I have a bunch more questions on this whole subject, but I'll, I'll move on. I did have uh, other, another question, but oh, um, Senator Port has her hand up. Senator Port. Yes, hi, uh, thank you, 
Chair Dibble and to the presenters, this is really helpful. Um, can you talk a little bit about the electric school bus grants? Um, it's my understanding that those are up to 100% cost coverage. And can you talk a little bit about what has been um, you know, presented so far in Minnesota and if we're doing anything or could be doing anything in the state to help school districts and municipalities who provide school busing for our children to apply for those grants? Thank you. Thank you. Whomever would like to respond. I'll just point out, um, Chair Dibble and members, thanks for the question. Um, on this calendar, you'll notice that third line of low and no emission um, as one is example of a discretionary grant program that's already had one round. Um, as a state, we were pretty successful in that as well. Um, did receive some funding for uh, EV type uh, capital improvements uh, in the vehicle area, um, but there's also, there's a lot of funding both in IIJA and some of the other large federal bills that uh, maybe would more specifically answer that question. Um, I'm thinking of, say, IRA and some of those other ones that we'd be happy to come back and respond in better detail. Great. That would be appreciated. Senator Park, anything further? Nope. Great. Thank you. A um, couple of additional questions on my part, unless others have questions. Um, did I hear you correctly? I think um, uh, it was, uh, let me see if I'm seeing this correctly. Uh, well, on the, on the bridge, on the uh, IIJA bridge program, um, the bullet on slide 12, uh, that looks like it's a pretty sweet deal. Um, it's a lot of money formula-based, 15% um, per state for bridges that are off the federal aid system with 100% federal share, no state or local match required. Did I, so that, that's just money. That's just free money coming to Minnesota. All right, excellent. Um, about $300 million for Minnesota. So, um, so the, but these would be for uh, state owned bridges, not the local bridges, correct? These are off-system bridges only, off -system. aren't they? Yeah. Chair Dibble and members, the off-system bridges are all local bridges. I see. Okay, great. That's awesome. And on that subject of uh, state um, and local, uh, okay, uh, for, um, well, I'll, I'll, I'll suspend on this because I don't want to hog the microphone. I'll go to Senator Jasinski. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and apologies. I want to go a little bit backwards. So we're talking about the passenger rail, and I think I saw a report somewhere that said that the passenger rail has lost more ridership than any other transit system around since COVID-19. So, and I know I put in a report. We've asked for a report for a while. So with not having the results of that report yet, why would we go forward with more money spent on passenger rail when we're looking at What's all been happening? It's it's COVID. It's the change workforce. People how they how they're working, working from remotely, and all those things. And if that's the most system, the system has lost the most ridership. Why would we be spending money on that specific item? Uh, whomever would like to respond. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Senator Jasinski. Uh, the uh, the funding that will be available for passenger rail coming to Minnesota, we, we do want to take advantage of that and make sure we have modal options um, available to all Minnesotans who want to move about the state. So we don't want to lose out on any opportunities there for uh, enhancing our passenger rail system. Senator Jasinski. Uh, thank you. Uh, Madam Commissioner, so, but again, again, we've put in for a report to get those results, so why would we want, won't we want to wait to the results before we start spending the money? I, I think, you know, it's the cart or the egg first. I mean, which, I, I would think we'd want a report saying, here's what's going on before we'd spend more money on, on passenger rail. If we're fiscally, you know, watching what we're doing, we should be at least responsible to find out what the results are before we start spending the money on it, my, would be my opinion. So noted, you'll have much more opportunity to emphasize that at our upcoming train day. Train day. <laughs> so we'll Thank hear you, more Mr. about Chair. that. Um, and then finally, um, 
similar to the question I asked when you made the same presentation in bonding. Um, uh, uh, I'm uh, wondering how we're going to help local units of government who might not be well positioned either with um, funds uh, for a match and or even the ability to um, figure out what they should be applying for and also preparing those applications for the specifically the discretionary funds um, that are granted on a competitive basis. How, how would we envision uh, positioning our local units of government um, in the best position possible to compete for the states? Because, you know, even local units of government are part of Minnesota, um, uh, states, our state's share of IIJA funds. So, Chair Dibble and members, uh, I think that's a great question. Um, there will be some addressing of that issue when the governor's budget comes out tomorrow. I think, to your point, Discretionary grants are complicated and take a lot of time and effort and money to prepare them. And so I think there's an acknowledgement that we as an agency need to do as much as we can to help our local partners make successful applications. And so that's definitely a part of our budget uh, just considerations going into tomorrow and Thursday as the budget is released. Great. I'm excited about tomorrow. All right, uh, Senator Carlson. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, did you have your hand up? Pardon me? Did you have your hand up? Yes. Okay, Senator Carlson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and I'm, I guess I have a curiosity question here from uh, page 19, uh, the bridge connect condition. And uh, it seemed to whiz past us real quick, the, uh, the Blatnick Bridge. Can you give, give us just a little bit more information on that? And when we're talking about 11.3% uh, as being in the red, uh, is that counting at one bridge? Or is that counting the, the amount of money that it's going to take to take that one bridge away from the poor condition? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Chair, Chair Dibble, Mr. Senator Carlson, uh, Chair? great question. So yes, um, that 11%, a large part of what's driving that poor condition is Blatnick is a very large part of that NHS system for bridge. And we currently have some funding identified for Blatnick nowhere near what we need. So there's a sizable gap on that project. And so right now, that end of chip number assumes we do not address Blatnick. So that 11% could conceptually get a lot better if funding for Blatnick is identified. Yeah, follow up. So that's, that's, that includes money. That's not just counting bridges. Am I correct on that? Mr. Kanadarud. Mr. Dibble, Senator, yes. So the chip um, is based on our assumed investment, current investment levels and the projects we fund with those investments. Right now, Blatnick is not fully funded, and so that drives that percentage poor. And um, just so that we under, so the public who's watching understands what we're talking about, can you just give us the 30 seconds on the Blatnick Bridge, what it is, where it is, and how much it's going to cost to replace it? And then, I, and then actually, I do have a question. Uh, we, did, we didn't get the grant that we applied for that was discussed earlier. Are we able to reapply? Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. To describe a little bit more about the Blatnick Bridge, it's one of our longest bridges on the state highway system, and it is uh, a bridge that connects Duluth to Superior over uh, the St. Louis River area. It's uh, one of two bridges in Duluth that go over, that connect the two states. Um, but this, uh, this one, the Blatnick Bridge, is the older of the two. And uh, it, its condition is such where um, we've been investing in the bridge to be able to keep it open to traffic and truck traffic. But it is um, currently posted at legal loads only. So overweight loads can't go over the bridge right now. Um, it is definitely in, in need of a large investment, as Mr. Kanadrud Hubringer was describing. And um, when we look at our bridges and our bridge condition, we talk in terms of surface area of the bridge, not just by number. So as we're looking at bridge condition, um, the uh, Blatnick Bridge, when you consider its, its surface area, is over 1% of the bridges on the state highway system. So it is uh, a large part of our um, bridge inventory. 
And uh, as we were talking about the application we made to the IIJA Bridge Improvement Program for large bridges, we were not successful this year. I heard from our Federal Highway Administration partners that there were um, at least 40 applications for that large bridge category. Four projects were funded and two got quite a bit of funding. And Mr. Phillips was mentioning the Brent Spence Bridge between Ohio and Kentucky uh, got a, a very large award, which is rather encouraging actually that um, as we apply in future years, and we do plan to do that, that we hope to be um, successful that way too, since we also have a large gap on the project. I should note um, that Border Bridge is co-owned by um, the Minnesota and Wisconsin DOTs, so we are partners going into that application. The cost of the project is um, roughly $1.8 billion. Um, the cost of the bridge part of the project, we split 50-50 with the, with the state of Wisconsin, and then we each have our own approach roadway work that we each fund individually. $1.8 billion. <laughs> um, so um, I have Senator Lang, and then I'll call on Senator Howe. Senator Lang. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, to the testifiers, I, I think that you kind of hit the nail on the head, and I had my question before you two guys, gentlemen, asked it, but uh, uh, it was kind of along the same lines. You know, I remember the 35W bridge being a $350 million bridge, and I remember uh, there's several other bridges as we've gone through the Transportation Committee that are eating up the transportation budget. So if you could go to slide 12 again, uh, the 25 or 27.5 billion, I think, it, yeah, that one. Thank you. Um, how many bridges do we have in the state of Minnesota that are at, you know, at that $100 million mark or, or more, and what kind of dent can we actually put into that, even if we fully fund this program? I, I, I guess the numbers aren't matching up, matching up in my head um, when we're talking about one bridge that, uh, you know, half of $1.8 billion even. So I don't know if that's a really good question you have a really decent answer for, but... <laughs> Commissioner. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator Lang, um, I believe the question was how many bridges do we have in our program, our state highway program, that are over 100 million or so? You, Mr. Chair, and I, I, I don't know if that's a, even a, a decent dollar amount to start judging things off of, but um, when you, your bridge program, I, I in, in, you know, educate me on the process of uh, where do you start pulling from this fund, and what does that number of bridges look like? Commissioner. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, there are, and, and Senator, there are a, a number of bridges that would be el eligible for this bridge program. Uh, there is the large bridge program, and then uh, smaller bridges are also part of the program. We are still waiting on hearing from, on some of the awards for the smaller bridges in the, pro the bridge improvement program. Um, but in terms of larger bridges, the over 100 million, um, Blatnick was the only bridge we applied for. And coming down the pike, I don't know offhand, I'm gonna look to my colleagues to see if they know if a lot of their bridges are in the program that are large like that. Mr. Kanadarud. Hubinger. Chair Dibble, Senator, uh, we can also circle back with a more accurate answer, but there are quite a few bridges that are coming to the end of their useful life. So fair to say that's 10 or more, um, not in that 1.8 billion range, but in that couple hundred million. Um, a lot of the bridges we have were built about 50 or more years ago, and so we really are, we've been referring to this over the last couple of years as the bridge bubble coming up. There are quite a few of them in the pike. So this obviously helps this formula money, this discretionary program, which we will continue to apply to, will help, but there are, is still far more need than money out there. We could have a bridge day, Senator Lang, if you're interested. A bridge sheet. <laughs> All right, we'll ask, we'll, do a, we'll ask for a bridge sheet and then see if that blossoms into a bridge day in Transportation Committee. Senator Howe. Well, I, thank you, Chair Dibble, and I would, I would be very interested in a bridge day because uh, my question is gonna go down that road. When you say useful life, uh, could you tell us kind of the, when that bridge was built and then 
what is the useful life of a bridge? Where, how do we determine that? Because I'm going to use that same old adage I've used in the past. I've been all over the world driving big army trucks. We've driven over bridges that were well over 100 years old, and people say, well, they were over-engineered, and I'm going, yeah, I don't buy it. Uh, you know, so what modern engineering techniques, we can build things lighter, cheaper, but I don't think they last longer. So give me an idea of what a useful life of a bridge is. Ms. Uh, Commissioner Dobbenberger. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Senator Howe for that question. I can talk a little bit about bridge life. So um, probably starting oh, 50, 60 years ago, at that time anyway, we were building bridges for what we had assumed to be about a 50 year life. Now, based on new technologies, materials, we're designing bridges for more like a 100-year life. But even for those bridges that were designed, built 50, 60 years ago, typically with the, uh, the traffic loads, the elements, the conditions of the, the condition of those bridges will start to deteriorate. Um, we do routine maintenance on those bridges. Um, we do some preventative maintenance, but ultimately we need to make an investment in those bridges to get more life out of them. And uh, in, in the Minnesota climate that we have, oftentimes that's been in the way of uh, redecking the bridge, so putting a new driving surface on it, concrete deck typically, um, which is a tremendous investment in a bridge to put a new deck on it. But typically when we get to the need to do that, maybe 30 to 40 years into the life of a bridge, redeck it. That kind of bumps the life expectancy back up, and then it will then um, further deteriorate over time. And then typically when you get to that, what was 50 years, now we're assuming more like 100 years. There are other things going on with the bridge, too, that um, have deteriorated the condition to the point where typically at that point we look to replacement. There have been bridges designed and built over time that are, are very staunch, and uh, we've gotten a lot of extra life out of them, more so than the 50 years that maybe were assumed when they were designed. However, there are bridges, too, that were designed in an era where materials were very expensive, and engineers sharpened their pencils and, and uh, designed and built a very efficient bridge. And those are the ones typically then we're looking to replace when they get to the end of their useful life as opposed to making another investment to keep them there. So it depends on the type of bridge, the era it was built, the materials that were used. Uh, but uh, typically we see anywhere from 50 to now we're assuming 100 years of service life. Senator Howe. No, I... I, I you know, I think that many times we engineer things and we don't think about, you know, for a little bit more money, we can get a lot more life out of them and we need to kind of rethink that process of, uh, of uh, spending a little less and losing a lot more. So I, I think that uh, a little bit of scrutiny on that end of the deal would probably be money well spent. Thank you. Well, we have the right commissioner to talk bridges. <laughs> Spent a lot of her career over at MnDOT thinking about the bridges and bridge programs. So, sorry. Uh, Senator Chazinski. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And again, I appreciate all the money from IAJA to put into our roads and bridges, and I think it's great because I think there's not one person up here that doesn't agree with putting more money into our roads and bridges. But I, I, and I can understand how the construction costs, and I know there's always some admin costs, but and I understand those. But so when you go to uh, slide 13, so I, I can imagine a road project, you can imagine a bridge project, but tell me as far as some of the new highway uh, climacy and resiliency programs, what type of projects? Uh, I see we have 107 million over five years, so I, I know examples of road projects and bridge projects. Give me some examples of climate and resiliency programs that we're going to spend 107 million on, please. Uh, oh my, uh, Mr. Kanatarud Hubinger. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Senator. So um, we're still in the early stages of picking specific projects since these are new programs. So we have a lot of stakeholder outreach and kind of review of the new requirements. Um, but ultimately, actually a lot of these, these dollars will go towards kind of normal existing type projects, maybe with a little more. So things like uh, to prevent flooding bigger culverts, as an example, things like that. It, it's actually 
more kind of vanilla bread, bread and butter, road and bridge type projects with maybe a little bit more built out to account for, say, reduced climate emissions or to prevent flooding for going forward. Great. All right. Thank you. Anything further, members? All right, well, thank you very much for the presentation. If someone from MnDOT could stay close uh, as I present Senate File 24 in case they ask me hard questions. <laughs> and I will uh, turn the gavel over to Senator Morrison. Welcome to the committee, Senator Dibble. Uh, thank you, Chair Morrison. Uh, Chair Morrison and members, I'm here to present Senate File 24, um, which um, just, you know, in very high level uh, description, um, uh, as members know, the IIJA was signed into law uh, in November of the year before last, um, and it provides both formula funding uh, increases as well as discretionary uh, programs. Um, I think about 75% of the dollars that would be coming to Minnesota um, are going to be used for transportation purposes. Um, see in my notes that Minnesota is estimated to receive about $7.4 billion uh, over the life of the IJA. What this bill would propose to do is would allow for um, the appropriation of uh, federal money um, that has flowed into the Trunk Highway Fund uh, for straight road construction on the Trunk Highway system. Um, they are available due to the IIJA, but MnDOT uh, can't use them without the legislature providing this authority or appropriating these dollars. Um, MnDOT has um, had shuffled some money already uh, to take advantage of this expanded ability to do more. Um, and so, in effect, what we would be doing would be kind of restoring MnDOT back to the state um, in which it was uh, uh, earlier. So, uh, in other words, $235 million would go to restore trunk highway bonds, uh, $80 million uh, to fully fund the approved fiscal year 23 STIP. Um, so, that's uh, essentially $315.5 million to MnDOT for state road construction and the fiscal note is effectively zero, so no state, no new state dollars would be going. So with that, um, we have a few folks who want to come forward uh, and testify in support. Thank you, Senator Double. Uh, looks but like- we'll In the meantime, I'm certainly open to respond okay. to questions if folks have questions before we do that. Would you prefer to field questions now or should we wait until after the testifiers? I think, presented? yeah, well, why don't we have the testimony and then we'll go, go to questions. And Okay, great. Um, I would invite John Thorson from Lyonup to testify. And testifiers, we've allotted three to four minutes per testifier, so please, if you could limit your remarks to that time, please identify yourself and proceed with your testimony. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. Uh, my name is John Thorson. I'm Legislative Director for Lyuna, Minnesota, North Dakota. We're Minnesota's infrastructure union representing more than 14,000 skilled construction laborers who build and maintain the roads, highways, bridges, and transit, and critical utilities that allow our communities to thrive. I'm here today to support Senate File 24, a bill appropriating the $315 million necessary to unlock uh, federal funds available to Minnesota through the IIJA. Minnesota's transportation infrastructure needs are great, and this proposal accelerates repairs to the over 660 deficient bridges and our nearly 5,000 miles of highway rated in poor condition. It also better positions communities to compete for additional uh, discretionary federal funding to rebuild Minnesota's roads and bridges, improve transit, and install electric vehicle charging network uh, throughout the state. Senate File 24 will make Minnesotans safer, 
It'll boost our economy and create thousands of family supporting construction careers throughout the state. We're very excited about the career and economic inclusion opportunities this bill will bring to Minnesota's construction industry through registered apprenticeship programs that increase participation of women, people of color, veterans, and others not yet fully participating in our economy to their full potential. And we know that a union card combined with prevailing wage is and will always be a ticket to the middle class. You might not get rich, but you'll provide for your family, have good health care, uh, that you can count on and retire with dignity. Both the IIJA and IR, uh, Inflation Reduction Act give preference to grant applicants who provide a plan to comply with federal labor and employment law, which include use of a skilled workforce through registered apprenticeships, taking steps to prevent the misclassification of workers, paying prevailing wage benefits uh, to workers, and using project labor agreements uh, including local hire provisions and uh, commitment to union neutrality. A partnership with unions can improve an applicant's score and bring more federal resources to our communities. Layuna has experience working with municipalities, developers, and utilities on both IIJA and the Inflation Reduction Act competitive grant proposals. We can help applicants throughout the process, from letters of support to assisting with compliance, meeting apprenticeship requirements, and other labor standards. Uh, Madam Chair, I'd like to thank Chair Dibble uh, for bringing forward Senate File 24. Uh, this bill will unlock investments that move our state forward, will create and maintain thousands of good paying union jobs, and will drive economic growth in every corner of our state. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thorson. Uh, next up is uh, John Pollard from the International Union of Operating Engineers, Local 49. Please identify yourself and proceed with your testimony. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and members of the committee. For the record, my name is John Pollard. I'm with the International Union of Operating Engineers, Local 49, representing over 14,500 men and women who work in both public and private construction. Uh, the members of Local 49 are heavy equipment operators that you will find on projects ranging from roads and bridges, residential and commercial construction, and energy projects across the state. They are highly skilled and take great pride in the work that they do. Thank you for the opportunity to testify briefly today on Senate File 24. Thank you to Chair Dibble for bringing the bill forward and for the quick passage this session and the efforts to move it on. Members of this committee know the challenges that the state faces all too well. Minnesota has the fifth most transportation lane miles in the state. The state's highway investment plan has identified almost 17 billion in unmet needs over the next 20 years for an annual funding gap of over 885 million and has been testified to already twice today, there are hundreds of bridges rated in poor condition. In 2022, the American Society of Civil Engineers gave our road system a failing grade of a D plus. Though the investments made by the IIJA put a good dent in this work, they don't close all of the gaps, but it's a step in the right direction. As MnDOT just testified to, uh, the IIJA will mean another $4.8 billion in federal funding over the next five years, or a 30% increase in the highway funding formula. Equally as important is this bill is an investment in the men and women and the working families of Minnesota. On a comprehensive scale, construction is a $16 billion industry in Minnesota and supports more than 130,000 jobs. These are good paying family supporting jobs. They include livable wages, health care, and pensions. Again, thank you for the opportunity to testify. Thank you, Mr. Pollard. Uh, next up is um, Abby Bryduck from the Minnesota Asphalt Paving Association. I hope I pronounced your name correctly. Please identify yourself and proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. My name is Abby Bryduck. I'm the Executive Director of the Minnesota Asphalt Payment Association. Um, I brought, brought a colleague up with me as well, if he'd like to go after. Can, can I interrupt, excuse me, just get your a little bit closer to the microphone, okay. please. Thank you. Uh, Madam Chair, members of the committee, my name is Joe Bagnoli. I'm a lawyer with uh, Winthrop and Weinstein Law Firm, and I'm here on behalf of the Concrete Paving Association. When possible, uh, sometimes folks think that concrete and asphalt 
are in opposition, but there are many times where we are actually in sync. Uh, I am just here to show that visually as well as Abby will provide the, uh, the, the good words, but we are, we are in lockstep. We are, I'd like to say, in concrete on this one. Madam Chair, I'm going to... I'm going to take the photo being taken, and it's going to be my new screensaver. <laughs> Let it be known that I have brought asphalt and concrete hey. together. Senator Dibble. So. Proceed with your testimony. Yeah, Thank you. Do you want to say anything more? No, other than, th than this was a hit, so I'm glad we did this. But, um, <laughs> um, anyway, I, we would like to, so the Minnesota Asphalt Pavement Association is a trade association that represents asphalt pavers uh, in Minnesota who do work anywhere from driveways to interstates. It probably wouldn't surprise you to hear that an industry group like this and like CPAM is supporting this bill. Obviously we are, but we especially want to thank you for your willingness to fast track um, the language and we know this will be a big help with our cash flow situation at MnDOT. Um, and we also, like the previous testifiers mentioned, uh, just want to emphasize that while this is some uh, welcome funding, it is not a windfall for our industry, and um, uh, we still have a lot of work to do in uh, bridging the gap. Thank you. Ditto, Madam Chair. Very good. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, next up is Laura Ziegler of the Associated General Contractors. Please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. And be sure you get very close to the microphone. Thank you. <laughs> Good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Chair Dibble, that's a tough act to follow. Uh, we do not take a position on either. We support both. Uh, but again, for the record, my name is Laura Ziegler with Associated General Contractors of Minnesota. Uh, we re represent over 400 members across the state, uh, build any and all infrastructure, roads, bridges, sewer, water, transit systems, you name it, our members build it. Uh, we also represent uh, commercial builders as well. We know the importance of transportation on those developments as well. We're really proud of our partnerships with the state, particularly MnDOT, uh, and our partners in the trades that are here today. Um, you received a one-page handout uh, from the Transportation Advocacy Coalition. Uh, there's a, a list of us on there, business and labor groups uh, dedicated to finding sensible short-term and long-term solutions uh, to fund our state's transportation infrastructure. And want to reiterate our thanks uh, to Senator Dibble uh, for authoring Senate File 24 and to you for hearing it so early in session. And of course, that is our ask uh, here today, is to act fast uh, to allow MnDOT to spend these funds that they have allocated. And of course, the sooner that the authorization is given, the better the position is uh, in the department to plan, and that has a direct impact on our members as contractors, so they can make the investments that they need in the capital, and they can have steady workflow for their members and their employees. Uh, one final note, we conduct an annual survey at AGC and roads and bridge work was a particular highlight, but it kind of has a little footnote because we didn't pass uh, the match. So this is critical work that you're doing here today, a much needed start, and thank you. I can be here for any questions. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, next up, last but not least, is Bentley Graves with the uh, Minnesota Chamber of Commerce. Please state your name and proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. My name is Bentley Graves. I'm with the Minnesota Chamber of Commerce, and uh, I'm here to kind of round out the Kumbaya Chorus here. Um, thank you for the opportunity to testify. Um, again, representing the Minnesota Chamber of Commerce, we represent more than 6,000 employers uh, spread all, all across the state, every corner of the state, every size of business, and every industry, um, and also work very closely with, uh, with our local cha chamber partners uh, who also uh, do great work on behalf of businesses across the state. Um, we work on, health, on transportation issues because businesses rely on a safe, reliable, multimodal, and efficient transportation system to get their consumers to their door and their employees to their door and their goods to market. Um, given that, we, uh, along with our members and local chamber partners, were very excited uh, about the passage of uh, the IJA and the generational investment that this would make in Minnesota's transportation infrastructure. Um, we were disappointed, however, uh, when uh, 
and when uh, uh, legislation didn't pass last session to um, to draw down those funds, uh, but we appreciate the quick work by Senator Dibble here today and others uh, at the department to get this legislation moving uh, so that we can put to work this first tranche of $315 million into our transportation infrastructure. Um, and we're, we're very happy to support the effort uh, here today to do that. Um, but I would remiss, be remiss if I didn't uh, know the fact that there's yet more work to do uh, to make uh, uh, longer, broader investments in our infrastructure. And uh, among those is providing the state dollars to, uh, to, to match the many opportunities that, uh, that you heard from midnight that are before us, uh, given the passages of, of the IIJ. So, um, as Ms. Ziegler said, we are part of uh, the Transportation Advocacy Coalition and look forward to working with all of you and, and Chair Dibble and others uh, to, to make the most of this opportunity that we have uh, to make some, some very meaningful investments in our transportation infrastructure this session. So thank you again for the opportunity to testify. Thank you for your testimony, Mr. Graves. Members, amendments or discussion? Senator Howe. Uh, thank you, Chair Morrison. And, and Senator Dibble, uh, my, I, I guess I look at the fund balance and I see that we've got 364 million in the fund balance, but only 259 million of that is unreserved. And we've got a policy to keep, you know, only use X amount of that. And I believe this will go against our policy and drop us down and dig into those reserves where we're supposed to leave so much there. With an $18 billion surplus, why aren't we using surplus dollars to pay this and then that would give us actually more dollars it would keep it would keep us within the policy and actually give us more dollars for for spending in transportation later senator dibble um an excellent question i might ask my budget experts at mindot to help me a little bit um i will re just kind of respond generally though to say that um uh these are dollars that have come uh to minnesota um which, um, which we simply can't use. Uh, if we, I mean, this bill is kind of, I mean, your question is a good one and a valid one and probably one that, that we need to talk about um, as we talk about doing the budget bill, the larger budget bill, um, and what that's gonna look like um, and you know, whether or not we should use surplus funds from the general fund, et cetera. But these are dollars that are just sitting there that would otherwise just simply not be available to us to use. Uh, at all, so. And just to add on to that, uh, members and Senator Howell, so um, it's a little tricky uh, for how it's showing up on the fund balance. So this bill would not violate that fund balance policy. We aren't recognizing the revenue side either. So if this bill passes, it would increase our federal revenue on the revenue side by that 315 million and then we'd be able to spend it as well. So it's a net zero. The reason that number is so big in the out years is because we forecast that revenue coming in, and then we ask for permission to spend it from this upcoming budget session since, since it's an operating year. So the numbers you gave when you kind of do all the math, we have about $92 million of available unreserved fund balance of state money. Everything else that's making that number really big is all the new federal money from IIJA that we can't spend yet for fiscal years 24 through 27. So this bill is kind of addressing something in 23 that's not showing up anywhere at this point. So it's more, more revenue, more spending, it's a completely net zero, would not violate our policy. Senator Howe? I'm not good with fuzzy math, but that looks like fuzzy math, but whatever, I'll, you know, I won't question you because I can't follow that, so. Uh, I have a hard time too, uh, Madam Chair, uh, <laughs> Senator Howe, um, uh, but we'll, uh, I mean, th these are important questions. Um, and we need to consider them because we're going to have a lot of discussion. Why not use just use the? I mean, what is what? I mean, the 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 reserves or the you know balance is important because we need we need to have that cushion, if you will, um, so that we don't get ourselves into a bad situation. That's just good fiscal management. Um, number one, number two, totally fair to discuss. Should we be using some of the uh, the surplus, general fund surplus for transportation purposes um, or not, you know, in the state road construction program, et cetera. Um, and we'll have a rollicking good debate around all those subjects in the very near future. But this, um, like I said before, is money that we haven't recognized, as it were, because um, 
we have failed to appropriate it and we need to do so. Senator Chizinski. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and Senator Dibble. Uh, so I, I think we're all in favor of this money. It's a great inflow of, of money coming into Minnesota to help projects. And I, I, even if you're a blacktop or a concrete, you can even agree on this as well, uh, that we want the money to go to actual construction. So I would like to offer the A1 amendment. Senator Jasinski, would you like to explain your amendment? And thank you, Madam Chair. Well, distributed. Senator Dibble would need one over there as well. But uh, and I apologize, I should have gotten in touch with you on this one, so I let you know it was coming. Uh, but I know we've always talked about admin costs versus hard construction costs, uh, and I know uh, Senator uh, Newman, if he were here, he would be concerned as well, uh, just to make sure that the majority of our money is going towards the construction costs and not admin. I think I took the 17% from what I believe in previous reports is what a typical admin cost is for projects. So of the 315.5 million, if you took 17%, that allows 53.6 million uh, for ad administrative to, for program delivery, uh, but would allow 83% to go to hard costs. So uh, I hope you'd consider a friendly amendment. It's just some guardrails to make sure we're spending our money on an actual project. So uh, with that, I uh, would appreciate you. Uh, yes, vote. Thank you, Madam Chair. Senator Dibble, or members' discussion? Uh, Madam Chair, um, uh, I would uh, view this amendment as uh, friendly and would encourage a positive vote for the A1. With the, with the caveat that if uh, I find out more and it's a terrible idea in the future, we'll have more discussion. <laughs> Senator Jasinski renews his motion um, to amend Senate File 24. Uh, all in favor, aye. say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. Motion passes. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Senator Dibble. Further discussion, members? Senator Dibble, would you like the final word? Um, thank you. Uh, uh, Madam Chair, members, um, as uh, Mr. Graves uh, said, um, this is not the uh, end of the discussion on IIJA. Um, this is basically cleaning up um, some leftover work from the previous session. Um, there's going to be a lot more discussion about some of the things I asked about earlier, um, state match, local match. Uh, helping local units uh, be as responsive as possible. We'll have some debate on what we should be using IJA for, you know, passenger rail, EVs, all that stuff like we've had. Um, so uh, I look forward to those debates and that conversation. Um, but in the meantime, I would like to make a motion, Madam Chair. Members, any final discussion? Okay, uh, Senator Double moves that uh, Senate File 24 as amended be referred to the Committee on Finance. All in favor, aye. 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 Opposed? Uh, bill passes. <laughs> uh, thank you, Madam Chair and members. Okay, members, now we are going to um, have our kind of annual, if you will, uh, overview just to kind of get ourselves acquainted and reoriented with um, transportation, finance, basically what flows into the HUTDF and what flows out, et cetera. Um, and uh, this is our primer orientation. Everyone probably knows all this stuff and has, you know, 62.29.9. They see it when they close their eyes. <laughs> Tattooed on the back of their hands, I don't know. Um, from Ms. Boyd. Mr. Chair, if you'll permit me, I, I was not prepared as I should have been, and I need to get logged into Zoom and share my screen. So just take me a second.
Mr. Chair. Ms. White. All right. Now we're now we're cooking. <clears throat> All right. So this is our I'd say biannual biennial um, transportation finance overview. Um, I know we have several new members on the committee, um, so I'll try to be as thorough as I can. Um, so we'll start with this slide just to get a look at <clears throat> what we're funding in our jurisdiction. Uh, these are the agencies and programs under our jurisdiction uh, when we talk about transportation finance. And first, of course, is the Department of Transportation, which is 100% under our jurisdiction, uh, and the divisions of multimodal systems. So basically everything that's not Trunk Highway, uh, transit, aeronautics, freight, passenger rail, then state roads, the Trunk Highway system, construction, maintenance, uh, program delivery, including planning and research, et cetera, um, and then highway debt service is under state roads as well. <clears throat> and then local roads, uh, the, the, the state aid office covering county state aid uh, routes and municipal state aid routes, and then of course agency management operations of the, of the agency. And then under our jurisdiction as well as a portion of the Metropolitan Council operations uh, for Metro Transit and Metro Mobility. Um, there are other portions of the Metropolitan Council that would be under other committees jurisdictions such as parks and trails. And then <clears throat> again, a portion of the Department of Public Safety. Uh, I think roughly half of the divisions are in our jurisdiction. That would be state patrol, including capital security. Uh, driver and Vehicle Services, the Office of Traffic Safety, the Office of Pipeline Safety, and then Administration for the entire agency. Um, there are other divisions under Judiciary and Public Safety's jurisdiction, including the BCA and Alcohol and Gambling Enforcement, and things like that, <clears throat> since it's a pretty large agency. And next, just a snapshot here, excuse me, <clears throat> of the all funds budget in our jurisdiction, and this is projected for the next biennium. Um, from the last forecast. Uh, you'll see that the base budget is 10.1 billion, which is roughly a little under 10% of the total all funds budget for the state. Um, and the takeaway from this, one of the main takeaways from this slide would be to look at just how little uh, of a piece a uh, general fund plays into our budget. Uh, uh, transportation is funded largely through dedicated user taxes and federal funds. You'll see that the largest piece there, about a little under 40%, is trunk highway funds, and that includes federal highway funds. And then the next slice would be federal, and that is um, non-highway, non-trunk highway federal uh, fund receipts. And then we have the county state aid highway fund uh, is another large portion, a little under two billion for the biennium. Transit assistance, a little under uh, a billion, about 860 million for the biennium. Municipal State Aid Street Fund, <clears throat> excuse me, and, um, and then some special revenue funds. You'll see general fund is about seventh uh, in, in, in size in our all funds budget. And then just briefly under the other, the majority of that I'd say about two thirds is the state airports fund and the other, uh, the rest of it is, is some smaller funds. And then here is that general fund piece blown up. The majority of it you'll see about, oh, about 65% goes to Metropolitan Council, and that is for Metro Mobility and other transit, bus, light rail, commuter rail under Met Council. Uh, and again, I should point out that this is the base budget for the next biennium, uh, about 271 total million. The next slice would be for DPS. That is largely for capital security and some administration um, funded by the general fund. And then the, the last two pieces are for MnDOT. The, large, the largest of that is for uh, Greater Minnesota Transit. And then the other piece would be for things like uh, passenger rail, safe routes to school, uh, freight, things like that. Uh, just take a step back and see that uh, the constitutional framework for how we, we fund these things, and I'll show you a flow chart in a minute that, that shows how these are related. Uh, Article 14 in the Constitution uh, governs transportation funding, largely for highways. It does several things. It creates three highway systems, the trunk highway system and then the state aid uh, systems. It creates the major transportation funds, including the Highway User Tax Distribution Fund, which is a major pass-through fund in our area, and then it flows down to trunk highway and then the state aid funds. 
Uh, it also establishes some dedicated transportation taxes, the big three, the gas tax, tab fees, and MVES, motor vehicle sales tax. And the Article 14 also allows the state to sell bonds to construct and improve trunk highways, and uh, those bonds are backed by uh, funds in the trunk highway fund. So I'm not gonna read every word on this slide, it's just uh, to give you a picture of how funding works for highways in the state. Uh, the main red box in the middle is sort of the, the grandparent fund to all of this, the Highway User Tax Distribution Fund. And um, this is a year picture. This is, these are annual uh, figures, and this is from the um, transportation funds forecast. So this is what represented for fiscal year 24. So total revenue to the Highway User Tax Fund is about $2.6 billion. Um, all the revenue that flows into the Highway User Tax Distribution Fund is dedicated per the Constitution for highway purposes. And then you'll see on the top, the four green boxes are the major revenues to the Highway User Tax Distribution Fund. The gas tax on the top uh, is the largest piece. It's about 900 million for one year. 100% uh, of these revenues are constitutionally dedicated to HUTDF. Next tab fees is the next largest uh, piece and 100% of those revenues are dedicated. Motor vehicle sales tax, uh, about 600 million a year. 60% uh, of those revenues are dedicated to HUTDF. The other 40% are go to Metro and Greater Minnesota Transit accounts, which I'll talk about a little bit later. And then starting in uh, fiscal year 2018, this is our newest dedication. These are statutory dedications in the fourth box. They're not in the Constitution. Um, they are uh, taxes that previously were deposited in the general fund and are now deposited in the Highway User Tax Distribution Fund. Those are a set amount, about $146 million uh, worth of the sales tax on vehicle repair and repa replacement parts, otherwise known as auto parts sales tax. 100% um, of uh, two rental car taxes and 11% of the sales tax on motor vehicle leases. <clears throat> and then on the bottom is where these funds flow. So we've got the great majority of the HUTDF, 95%, uh, again, constitutionally required flows to the other three funds that I mentioned earlier, 62% to the Trunk Highway Fund, 29 to county state aid, and 9% to municipal state aid. Um, Trunk Highway Fund is unique in this area because it's directly appropriated. Um, the, the funds flow from HUTDF to the Trunk Highway Fund and then sit there until there's a, an appropriation made by the legislature. Those funds are used for trunk highway construction and maintenance and improvement. Um, and the trunk highway fund is also where the Federal Highway Administration formula funds are deposited. Uh, fiscal year 24, that's estimated to be 730 million, although as we talked about, that, that is going to increase a little bit. 29% um, uh, to the county state aid highway. I'll talk about these funds more in a minute, so I'm gonna go through these really quickly. Um, this money flows in and then is uh, distributed to counties by statutory formula, which I'll talk more about in a minute. And the same with the Municipal State Aid Street Fund. And then the 5% distribution of HUTDF off to the right uh, is an amount that comes off the, the top 5% of HUTDF, and that is um, up to the leg legislature to allocate. Um, and that can be reallocated more than once, or no more than once every six years. I believe the last time this was done was in the 2008 transportation finance package, so it's been more than six years. Um, but it's been roughly uh, 46.5, a little less than half of that 5% goes to town roads and bridges. Now that's, thir I believe, 30.5% to town roads and 16% to bridges. Um, yes. And then, and that's distributed by a formula uh, in statute as well. And then 53.5% of that goes to the flexible highway account. 16% of that, um, is, is, uh, goes to metropolitan counties, and um, that's split by population. Um, although I, I should note that Minneapolis and St. Paul are not included in that calculation. Um, uh, but Ramsey and Hennepin, I think, still do get the biggest pieces of that. And then the remainder that's left in the flexible highway account is up to uh, the discretion of the MnDOT commissioner for a certain uses listed in statute. Um, number one of those is turnbacks. Um, which is restoring uh, roads from the trunk highway system to cities or counties and any work that needs to go into that by agreement with the local to get that, uh, that road back into shape. So um, I believe there's still, I don't know the amount, but I believe there's still a backlog on turnbacks. And in the past couple of years, the, the flexible highway account has been used exclusively for turnbacks. <clears throat> 
Uh, moving on, I'm going to talk just a little bit more about each of the sources. Number one is the gas tax. And like I stated, 100% of the proceeds are constitutionally deposited in the HUTDF. The current tax rate of the gas tax is 28.5 cents per gallon. That's 25 cents actually for the gas tax, but there's a 3.5 cent per gallon surcharge um, on top of that that is dedicated to trunk highway debt service, and that's for a particular uh, bridge program that was enacted in 2008. And when the debt service on that program is paid down, that uh, surcharge will decrease and eventually blinker off. <clears throat> so the last increase for the gas tax was in the 2008 uh, transportation finance package. It was raised five cents. And then the last time it was raised was 20 years before that was raised three cents. On uh, the next slide, I'll show you uh, this next part, that a portion of the gas tax revenues, although they're deposited 100% in the highway user tax fund, are, a portion of them are transferred out to certain accounts under the Department of Natural Resources. And this is because when you put, uh, what the Constitution says is that the tax on the means of propelling a vehicle, um, it, it, it's, you can tax the means of propelling a vehicle on the public highways. Now, of course, when you're using a snowmobile or an ATV or a boat, you might have to put gasoline in it, but you can't take it on the public highway. So to account for those tax revenues that are collected, um, a certain amount are transferred back to um, certain accounts under the Department of Natural Resources. Just briefly here, you'll see uh, motorboat, snowmobile, ATVs, and off-highway vehicles and motorcycles, and then an account for forest roads. Um, and there's percentages set in statute. That's the estimated amount of gas that is consumed um, by these vehicles, and then you can see on the far right column, uh, those are fiscal year 2024 projected numbers from the forecast of how much those transfers would be. So 11 million, for instance, to the water recreation account for motorboats. <clears throat> and then coming back to our second largest source, TAB fees, again, 100% deposited in the HUTDF, all those revenues. Uh, there's a formula for how these registration taxes are uh, computed and collected. And for passenger vehicles, it's based upon the age and value of the vehicle. No surprise to anyone who's paid tab fees. Um, the base uh, tax is $10 and then is added on a percentage of the depreciated base value of the vehicle. Um, this change was made a couple years ago, I believe in 2020, that um, uh, for newer vehicles, those registered on or after November 2020, the, um, the extra tax rate is now 1.285%, and for older vehicles, 1.25%. Uh, and then all vehicles 11 years old or old, old pay $35. And for trucks, um, it's similar, but it's based upon the weight and age of the vehicle. <clears throat> Motor vehicle sales tax is, uh, we're getting into one that is not 100% deposited. Um, this was added to the state constitution under a 2006 amendment that dedicated invest revenues to transportation purposes. Uh, prior to that, um, it had been a general fund sales tax, although a portion of it was being dedicated to transportation and statute. Um, but the constitution now says that no more than 60% of this tax may, uh, goes to the HUTDF and not less than 40% for public transit. Um, so that year, the Transit Assistance Fund was created in statute. There are two accounts in there for Metro Transit and Greater Minnesota Transit. Um, that's where collect the uh, invest revenues, and then they're appropriated out to Metropolitan Council and MnDOT. So you'll see that the current statutory allocation is 60% to HUTDF, 36% to Metro Transit, and 4% to Greater Minnesota. And then these are the last, um, <clears throat> the newest, uh, enacted um, tax revenue sources that are coming to the HUTDF, uh, enacted effective 2018, if I remember correctly. Um, and these collectively, I believe, bring in about $200 million uh, per year, starting in the fiscal year 20, or, or according to the forecast for 24. The first is the motor vehicle lease sales tax. Um, this is split a number of ways. 11% of it comes to the HUTDF, and the other Places it goes are 38% to the Greater Minnesota Transit account and appropriated to MnDOT for that. 38% to the County State Aid Highway Fund. Um, and that, that is then only a portion to metro counties, excluding Hennepin and Ramsey, so the five remaining metro counties for their uh, road programs. 13% to the State Transportation Fund, and that is used for the local bridge program in statute. And the other taxes that were dedicated at the same time 
uh, that used to go to the general fund are the sales tax on auto parts. And again, that's a set figure that is transferred every year into the HUTDF, 145 million. And then there's two sales taxes, or two taxes on rental vehicles. One is the 6.5% sales tax, and one is the 9.2% other tax on rental motor vehicles. And those are 100% deposited in HUTDF. So those are the major sources, and I'm just going to show you briefly this revenue projection sheet from the last forecast. Um, you can see that the, the overall sources are still increasing every year. Um, there was, oh, sorry about that. <clears throat> uh, a couple takeaways from this slide. Uh, the, the chunk on the bottom, the green chunk, is the gas tax. And you'll see that uh, starting, it is increasing until we get to 2025, and then it starts to be decreasing uh, in terms of real revenue that's collected there. All the other sources are increasing, although the top portion is increasing only slightly because that has mostly auto part sales tax, and that is a set amount of 145 million in there every year. It's not a percentage increasing. Um, and I just, I'm sure we'll talk more about this when we talk about the governor's budget, but um, just wanted to point out that every year the total sources are increasing. However, on the last forecast that came out, it's de it, it is a slower growth uh, compared to last February's forecast. Um, for instance, for 22 and 23, I believe it's 3.5% less uh, total sources to HUTDF than they were under the February forecast. I think that's about 184 million. So that's where the money's coming from, and this is what we spend it out of, just briefly. There are the constitutional funds I already talked about. Um, then I'm going to talk about some other major dedicated funds that have different sources of revenue, one I've already touched on a little bit, but we'll get to those. So the Highway User Tax Distribution Fund, I've largely said all this to you, so I'll just real quickly, um, the constitutional revenues, again, are the gas tax, the TAB fees, and a portion of MVEST. Statutory revenues, the lease sales tax, auto part sales tax, and the rental car taxes. And then the distribution, the biggest portion is the 95% distribution to the other road funds, and then the 5% distribution that can be changed by the legislature right now that goes to town roads and bridges and to MnDOT's flexible highway account, mostly for turnbacks. Uh, the next fund to talk about is the trunk highway fund, and this receives the largest portion of the HUTDF revenues. In fiscal year 24, the projected revenue is about 2.4 billion. Now that includes 1.5 billion from the HUTDF passed through, and uh, as we mentioned from the forecast, was 730 million in federal highway aid. All the money in the trunk highway fund must be directly appropriated. Uh, in the next base budget, uh, roughly 80% is, uh, and these, these numbers stay pretty consistent, roughly 80% goes to MnDOT for state highway construction and, major, and maintenance and agency operations. Uh, about another 14% to debt service payments on existing trunk highway bonds, and 7% goes to the Department of Public Safety for state patrol operations. Um, and just briefly, there's limitations on the use of the trunk highway stated in the Constitution. Obviously, it's for the construction, improvement, and maintenance of trunk highways, and also debt service on the bonds. County State Highway Fund. This is always everyone's favorite thing to talk about. This is a pretty complicated... Um, formula that we have for distribution in CASA. Um, this receives 29% uh, of the highway user tax distribution. Um, the Constitution states it shall be apportioned among the counties as provided by the legislature, basically. And this is the current formula we have in statute. Uh, it goes to all 87 counties. It's split into two pieces, 68% uh, and 32%, the apportionment and the excess sum. And then each of those sums has a different um, distribution formula. You can see that uh, under the apportionment sum, the largest piece, it's, it's based, there's a piece going equally to each county, 10%, 10% going according to the county share of vehicle registrations, 30% going to the county share of CASA lane miles, and 50% going to the county share of construction needs. Um, and that, those construction needs are determined by county engineers working with MnDOT's Office of State Aid. And then the excess sum is another uh, piece of the CASA fund, and those are split by 40% uh, of registrations and 60% of construction needs in the counties. Um, and this all flows uh, on the formula. Uh, the commissioner puts out an order every year um, showing how these funds were uh, totaled and how they are being split out by county. 
And then the CASA also receives 38% of the motor vehicle lease sales tax revenue I mentioned earlier, and that's distributed only to five counties in the metro area, excluding Hennepin and Ramsey. Municipal State Aid Street Fund, the formula is a lot simpler. Uh, that receives 9% of the HUTDF distribution. And again, uh, the, the Constitution dictates that the legislature shall apportion these. Uh, municipal state aid uh, cities are those with populations of 5,000 or more. Um, so it does not go to every city in the state. And those revenues are distributed half uh, based on the city's population relatively. Whoops. Sorry about that. And half based on uh, construction needs, again, determined by engineers uh, working, local engineers working with MnDOT. <clears throat> and then moving away from the strict highway funds, we'll talk about the transit assistance fund. I already mentioned that that gets a portion of invest revenue, uh, 40%, and that is split 36 to Metro Transit and 4% to Greater Minnesota Transit. Um, this flows in and is statutorily appropriated to uh, Met Council and MnDOT, respectively. Um, and then the Greater Minnesota Transit Account also receives that piece, 38% of lease sales tax revenue. Um, so, uh, state funding sources for public transit. Um, obviously, there are other funding sources, including fair revenue. Um, for Greater Minnesota, there'd be, uh, in Metro Transit, there'd be local contribution and federal revenue. But these are just about the state funding sources. Uh, the great majority of it is from the Transit Assistance Fund, those statutory appropriations coming from MVEST and the Vehicle Lease Sales Tax. And then also uh, both uh, Metro and Greater Minnesota Transit receive direct appropriations in the biennial budget from the general fund. Uh, and just a little summary on the bottom, uh, Metro Transit, uh, it's operated by the Met Council in the seven county metro area. There are also several suburban transit providers, also known as opt-outs. They also receive state funds through um, uh, a portion of the motor vehicle sales tax that uh, is distributed by Met Council to the opt-outs. And then Greater Minnesota Transit are locally operated transit services. I believe there's 40 systems operating in the state right now, and that re they receive state and federal assistance through MnDOT's Office of Transit. And here's just a, a brief picture of what that looks like uh, for state sources. Uh, the two bars on the left are Met Council showing the green bar, the vast majority is from transit assistance, statutory funds, and uh, the blue bar below at 177 million uh, for the next two years is the base general fund appropriations. And that is for both uh, metro, metro mobility and other transit systems, bus and light rail, et cetera. Uh, the two bars on the right are from MnDOT. You can see that it's a smaller system uh, in Greater Minnesota Transit um, uh, funding and transit assistance uh, is $125 million there and then the base budget for general fund for Greater Minnesota Transit would be about $36 million. <clears throat> Moving on to the State Airports Fund. This is a whole separate fund that also receives dedicated revenue. Um, and it's not constitutionally dedicated, it's statutorily dedicated. And the sources are uh, aviation fuel taxes, aircraft registration tax, airline flight property tax, and sales tax on aircraft. Those are all dedicated to the state airports fund and then is appropriated in the biennial budget by the legislature to MnDOT's Air Office of Aeronautics, um, which then makes grants for capital improvements to uh, publicly owned airports in the state as you can see for facilities, equipment, runways, maintenance, navigational aids, et cetera. And there's just a, a little flow chart showing that again, and you can see the, the scope of it. And the next two years, the base budget from these sources is about 56.6 million. Uh, the sources are along the top. The greatest uh, source is the aircraft sales tax on the right. Um, and then you'll see on the bottom that it just, it's directly appropriated to the MnDOT Office of Aeronautics. And then just to sum up the Department of Transportation, um, just wanted to give you a picture of their uh, base budget uh, from the forecast for the next two years. Once again, pointing out that the majority of the funds are dedicated or federal funds, and that the general fund piece um, is 0.6%, a tiny little slice over there. Um, and that is, uh, again, mostly for Greater Minnesota Transit and some other, some other smaller pieces. 
Uh, and one more thing about transportation funding is, of course, we have transportation-specific bonding. Of course, uh, there are geo bonds that touch on transportation projects. Those are basically anything non-trunk highway, so things like transitways, rail, local bridges, et cetera. And the debt service on those bonds, of course, is paid from the general fund. However, as mentioned, the, st the state constitution allows for trunk highway bonds. Those, uh, the debt service on those bonds is paid from the trunk highway fund, and the proceeds are only for trunk highway purposes and can only be used for projects on the trunk highway system. So our last agency to talk about briefly is the Department of Public Safety and the transportation programs under our jurisdiction. Again, those are driver and vehicle services. Uh, driver and vehicle services are funded by the fees that people pay for their vehicle transactions and driver's licenses. That revenue is deposited in uh, several operating accounts in the Special Revenue Fund. And then those account revenues are directly appropriated to the department for the operations of DVS. I am so sorry. I keep bumping that. <laughs> okay, I'll get back there. Going to move it away from me a little bit. There we go. Uh, next is State Patrol, which is funded mostly by a direct trunk highway fund appropriation because it is the State Highway Patrol, um, except that the Capital Security Division under State Patrol is funded by a general fund because they are not policing the highways of the state. Um, then we have the Office of Traffic Safety. That is funded by uh, about, one billion, uh, about one million per year combination of trunk highway and general fund appropriations. Uh, the trunk highway fund appropriation for traffic safety is used to leverage, I think, uh, roughly 16 or 17 million per year in annual uh, federal safety funding. Then we have the Office of Pipeline Safety. This is funded by uh, pipeline safety inspection fee revenue uh, levied on uh, pipeline uh, owners. And that is uh, deposited into an account in the Special Revenue Fund, which is then appropriated back to the agency for operations of the department or, or for the office. And also uh, in our, under our jurisdiction is administration of the entire agency that is funded by several trunk highway and general fund operations. Uh, trunk highway uh, uh, appropriations within administration are um, generally to support operations of the state patrol within the agency. And then just a Brief picture of that uh, budget as well. Again, you'll see that general fund is a, a bigger chunk of a smaller pie, I suppose, um, but still not the main source of uh, funding for the Department of Public Safety in transportation, and that is mostly for capital security. I believe that's my last slide. Yes. Great. Any Thank questions? you, Ms. Boyd. Questions, members? Sure. Uh, Senator Jasinski. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and, and Ms. Boyd. And I know we've had this number before, and I know Senator Newman, again, has talked about it for years, uh, but with the $18 billion surplus, how much of our general fund goes towards transportation? I believe I've been heard before it's 0.4% of 1%, correct? Mr. Chair and Senator Jasinski. Ms. Boyd. Yeah, on slide... I don't remember what number it is. Uh, slide four, I believe. Uh, the pie with the general fund, I should have pointed that out on the top. Uh, the base budget for 24 and 25 is 0.5% of the entire state's general fund goes to transportation. That changes slightly year to year, but it's generally in that 4 to 6%, or 0 0.4 to 0.6% range. Thank you. Just, just, just a reminder to members, I mean, everybody's going to be a wanting part of the funds that we have available in our budget surplus, and, and transportation is only currently getting 0.5 of 1%. And I know there's a lot of people uh, that don't have a car that benefit from our transportation modes out there. Uh, so I, I hope everybody keeps that in mind, because uh, with cars getting more efficient, more electric vehicles, as we well have seen in here, our HUTDF funds are scheduled to start going down. So if we can keep that in mind, I know we worked last Last year, pretty hard to get 100% auto part sales tax. It would have been kept that increasing. So I hope we can remember that going into this year's uh, session with $18 billion surplus. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Senator Trzynski. Other questions, members? Um, I just had, um, I just wanted to just um, clarify a couple things. Uh, looking at slide six, our favorite flow chart. That's where, uh, you know, I wake up thinking 62, 29, 9, in the middle of the night. Um, I just want to make sure um, uh, flowing into this, we don't, none of the federal funds are reflected on this uh, 
depiction. I'm, I'm not seeing them, but if I'm missing them. If, I, if, I, if I'm correct, the federal funds that flow in, that would land on this chart, would flow directly into the Trunk Highway Fund correctly. Mr. Correct. Mr. Chair, that's correct. It's, it's just a little notation in the box for the Trunk Highway Fund at the bottom left. So federal funds would not come directly into the Highway User Tax Fund. Federal Highway Administration formula funds would come into the Trunk Highway Fund directly. Oh, I see. No, the $730 million. Right. Okay, right. thank you. And then uh, on motor vehicle sales tax on slide 10, the motor vehicle sales tax rate is 6.5%, uh, correct? Not 6.875% as the sales tax generally is? Mr. Chair, that's correct. Thanks. And then um, sales tax on rental vehicles, same thing, 6.5%, not 6.875%. Uh, Mr. Chair, I believe that's correct. I do want to check on that before I get back to you, uh, though. Great. It, the, the tax is 6.5%. That is what flows into. I, I believe there may be a piece that automatically comes off the top, and it, I just want to double check for you. Right, but 6.5% is what flows into the transportation funds, for sure. Thanks. The sales tax on motor vehicle repair, um, the $145.3 million annually deposited. That's just a set amount, correct? Mr. Does that, that's not a percentage. That's just a set amount, that 145.3. Right. Yeah, Mr. Chair, correct. That, was, that amount was set. It was a little lower the first two years and then phased up to 145 million, mm -hmm. I believe, starting in, I can't remember the fiscal year, 22 or earlier. Um, so that is a set amount, 145.644 million every year from the auto parts sales tax. Now, of course, uh, that is still an increasing source of revenue, so that percentage that of it that comes to transportation gets smaller every year. I believe right now it's somewhere in the 46, 47 percent range of the total. Right. You anticipated my next question. Um, and when we talk about general fund that comes into, um, it might have been over here, back on the chart on page six or slide six. Um, I can't remember where it was, but you talked about uh, general funds that flow into the HUTDF. Um, is that what we're talking about, um, or do we not regard those as general fund anymore, and we just kind of count them as effectively as special revenues, including like the motor vehicle sales tax now that it's uh, constitutionally dedicated? Um, how, how, yeah, how do we how do we think about general fund as it makes its way over to uh, transportation purposes? Uh, Mr. Chair, I mean, I suppose that depends on your perspective. I mean, they're not constitutionally dedicated transportation taxes. They are statutory dedications, which means they could revert back to the general fund if the legislature so, choose, so chooses. Um, uh, I've seen them call general fund sales taxes to transportation. Uh, it depends on whether you consider them dedicated at this point, but... That's where they went pre previously. Great. Thanks. How, how much, uh, maybe you answered this question already, Ms. Boyd. Mm -hmm. um, how much does the motor vehicle lease sales tax, the MBLST, raise? Total? Yes, um, total. I, I have a round number for you. I can get you a more precise number. It's around $100 million per year. $100 million? Forecast, yes. All right, so then it's easy to figure out how I much mean, each of these pieces. Uh, I can do that math. Sure. Yes. 11% <laughs> would be $11 million. Oh, you okay. know what? I am so wrong. I'm thinking of another source. I'm, I'm glad I checked my notes, Mr. Chair. Sorry about that. You're talking about the motor vehicle lease sales tax, correct? Right, yes. right. That is about, well, I'll tell you this way. Um, the Greater Minnesota Transit Account and the County State Aid Highway Fund each have an equal portion of the lease sales tax, and they, uh, per year, will receive about $22 million uh, in the next, uh, in the next uh, base budget year, fiscal year 24. Uh, the local bridges get 13%, and that's about $7.6 million. And then the HUTDF gets 11%, which is about $6.4 million projected in fiscal year 24. So I'm going to do quick math at the desk and it's going to be wrong, <laughs> but it's just a little shy of 60 million. All right. 
Thank you. And I believe that funding source is down, Mr. Chair, in the last forecast from the previous one. Then one final, and these are all like very small, tiny um, technical questions, but um, I, I seem to recall that um, gas used, um, not for highway purpose, includes gas used on farms, like farm equipment, pickup trucks, et cetera. How, um, but it's not scooped off the top and you know, similar to those DNR, I think it's, it's accounted for or those who pay gas tax and use gas for those purposes are then entitled to a rebate. How, how does that work? What is the mechanism and how much, and, and does that mean then that those dollars effectively come out of the general fund, um, even though it's collected and used in the highway user tax distribution fund? Is that kind of a quasi general fund support for the highway user tax distribution fund? How does that work? Help us understand that. Mr. Chair, can. I don't have an easy answer for you on that one. I'm not an expert on that process. Um, anyone who is, an el who is eligible for a gas tax refund because their use is not for public highways, um, that refund would come out of the highway user tax distribution okay. fund and not the general fund because that's where the revenues were flowing and, and would be a rebate of that. Um, but I, I, I'll get a better answer for you on particularly farm use and things like that unless someone in the audience wants to, wants to weigh in on that. But. Yeah, I'm just, I'm curious to know kind of how that mechanism works and how much money that, mm -hmm. that comes to annually or biennially. Is anyone prepared to answer today? All right, that sounds like a Department of Revenue question, right? All right, so Mr. Kanatarud Hubinger, are you, are you saying yes? Are you saying, I do know, I don't know? <laughs> All right, why don't you come to the table? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Members, again, for the record, Josh Kennard Hubinger, MnDOT CFO. Um, Ms. Boyd is correct, so it's netted out of that HUTD number. So there's a process that Department of Revenue goes through every month to reconcile all of the gas tax collections and then what ultimately is net, net attributable to HUTD. So they actually produce a report every month and every year that kind of itemizes all of those items. So it's things like farm um, shrinkage, uh, tax-exempt vehicles, things like that and then there's a pretty decent itemized summary of each one, so we can provide that very easily. But it's netted out, so that 900 million that Ms. Boyd showed for gas tax, that's net of all of those things. And then in addition, you back out that 20-ish million for DNR. All right, thanks. I'd be curious just to know what that number is, thanks. Um, now, one question maybe you can answer, Mr. Knatterud Hubinger. I, I should know, and I think I do know, but I just need to be reminded. So the, all the funds that flow through the airports fund are then granted out to state airports. How is that? Um, how are those grants determined? Do they flow to the state airports on a formula basis, or are those competitive grants, or special projects pop up? How, do, how does that work? Yep. So, Chair Dibble, so there's uh, a similar mechanism, kind of like Trunk Highway Funds. So there's a process for divvying out money for capital projects that also is now under the purview of that project selection policy that recently got expanded. Uh, and then there's a separate pot for uh, maintenance and operations grants, which is a little bit more of a across the board, think like the county or city distribution and then there's some admin money that MnDOT uses to maintain the overall system. And I want to say it's, of that $25 million a year, it's about $18 million is out for capital and M&O, and then there's about $6 million for admin, something to that effect. And does airline flight property tax, that's tax on airplanes? That's on commercial airplanes, Chair Dibble. So that's the one that Delta and Sun Country, et cetera, pay. Right. And then the registration tax is the tax that um, non-commercial personal pilots pay. And um, aircraft sales tax, is that 6.5% or 6.875%? The uh, airports fund receives the same 6.5%. I believe that one collects the full revenue. It does. Um, but the other portions, that 0.375, go to the legacy funds. Okay. For that one. Great. Thank you. That's all I've got. Anything else, members? All right, I'll give you seven minutes of your life back. <laughs> Actually, I'm going to take a minute back. Um, Ms. Ethier, can you tell us what's happening on Wednesday? Um, and then I don't think we quite have next week figured out, but we will by tomorrow. I'm going to talk to you, Senator Jasinski, about next week. Um, 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Wednesday, we will be having a hearing that will include local units of government. Their associations will come in to speak about their uh, transportation needs. And then we'll have a presentation on clean transportation from the Sierra Club, clean, uh, fresh energy, and other groups. All right. No bills, though. But we have about 52 bills that have been referred to the committee, so we're starting to get to that critical mass where we can start chunking them up into themes um, and start uh, cranking bills through this committee. So get them in, get your hearing requests in, and we'll start, uh, we'll start legislating. All right. Uh, anything else, members? All right. We are adjourned. <laughs>